afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Moses Choi, and along with Carlos Vega and my colleague Will Barkis, we'll be leading this session today. Before we get started, let me just set the scene. The unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced the importance of digital financial services, from contactless payments to e-commerce to online banking. With millions dislocated from the workplace, the financial services industry has played a central role in supporting liquidity for consumers, small businesses, and corporations. This session looks at how fintech innovators have adapted during the height of the pandemic and how they are moving into the next normal. Our session today is a part of a webinar series called Business Resilience in All Times that Orange is organizing to support business leaders throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Orange Silicon Valley has been participating in the Silicon Valley ecosystem for approximately 20 years through investments, strategy, and technology innovation with a team of 45 subject matter experts focusing on 17 areas of technology innovation. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Carlos Vega, co-founder and CEO of Tesorio, who will provide his expert insights on business transformation amid COVID-19, with particular insights in treasury, finance, and liquidity management. He will share his strategic insights and discuss how Tesorio is helping CFOs, treasurers, and other finance, finance professionals in managing into the next normal. I'd also like to introduce my colleague, Will Barkis, who is a principal here at Orange Silicon Valley. Will is gonna be helping us out during the Q&A portion of the session. Over the next 45 minutes, I'll take us through some of the context and FinTech trends in 2020. I'll then hand it over to Carlos for an overview of Tesorio. Then we'll kick it off with a few questions and of course, open it up to Q&A. During the Q&A, I just wanted to flag that uh, your questions will automatically appear when you type into the chat area. And if you prefer more private space, then you can anonymously submit questions in the questions area on the right side of the screen. So let's get started. 2020 started off for the financial service industry uh, very strong. In January, Visa, of course, announced that it would acquire Plaid in a $5.3 billion transaction. Established in 2013, Plaid enables applications to connect with users' banks' accounts. Through its APIs, Plaid's products enable consumers to conveniently share the financial information with apps such as Acorns, Betterment, Chime, and Venmo. The purchase price was nearly two times the previously priced private investment round. Then in February, Intuit, the maker of QuickBooks, TurboTax, and Mint, announced a $7.1 billion transaction to acquire Credit Karma. Founded in 2007, Credit Karma is widely known for giving consumers access to their credit score and the ability to shop financial products. Credit Karma and Intuit are poised to help build a more complete financial profile so consumers can improve their financial health. Then of course, in March, we were hit with the coronavirus. This black swan event was unexpected and not within the range of normal expectations. With 3.4 million cases, 136,000 deaths attributed to COVID and 48 million plus claims of unemployment benefits in the US, the pandemic has resulted in economic contraction both here and globally. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced rapid changes to the global labor workforce uh, with almost a near shutdown of in-person work, education, dining, and civic life more broadly. Any organization relying on face-to-face -face interaction has significantly scaled back operations or completely, completely shut down. The US La Department of Labor recorded its highest spike in unemployment insurance claims ever recorded during this time. I personally recall the seriousness of the coronavirus when the NCAA canceled its college basketball tournament. And I'm sure everyone dialed in around the world today has had their COVID moment. Many have had friends and family affected and our thoughts and prayers are with you all. Before diving into how financial services innovators such as Tesorio have reacted, to understand some context of the U.S. consumer. The U.S. economy is disproportionately driven through consumption. 
More than 70% of US GDP is derived through consumption, and much of this is afforded through the availability of debt. And Americans are saddled with it. US consumer debt levels have surpassed those of pre, the pre-Great Recession, hitting 14.1 trillion, including among other, among other sources, 9.6 trillion mortgage debt, 1 trillion in credit card debt, and 1.5 trillion in student loan debt. In addition, nearly half of the American population, approximately 40%, cannot afford a $400 expense, leaving American households particularly vulnerable to economic shocks. It is also very important to understand some of the similarities and differences between the Great Recession and that of the pandemic today. First and foremost, the Great Recession of 2008 and 9 was a financial event, whereas today's crisis is a public health pandemic. Secondly, the root cause of the 2008 crisis was sector specific, mainly focused on banks, which are over levered through mortgages, collateralized debt obligations, and other exotic financial instruments. COVID-19 is very unique in that it, ha it has caused widespread supply side and demand side impacts that extend into every aspect of our lives. As a result, the policy interventions cannot solely focus on propping up the banking system. In light of COVID-19, the US government has had to harness both monetary policy and fiscal policy. Monetary policies influence money supply, for example, by lowering the target interest rate to stimulate credit flows in the economy. And this thus leaves disproportionate expectations on fiscal policy, really getting hand, cash into the hands of consumers, small businesses, and corporates. The challenge for the US government prior to COVID-19 was that the Federal Reserve had already lowered interest rates to historic lows and had implemented measures such as injecting liquid liquidity into the repo market of 1.5 trillion announcing purchases of agency bonds and mortgage bonds to the tune of 700 billion, announcing a backstop in commercial paper markets and a move to buy corporate bonds from distressed companies. So on March 27th, when Congress passed the CARES Act, the $2.2 trillion financial rescue package, fiscal rescue, excuse me, fiscal rescue package was unprecedented. Uh, the measure, of course, included direct payments to Americans based on income limits and the number of dependents. Uh, as of June 2020, uh, there's been roughly $270 billion of stimulus checks that have been sent. Of course, we also saw $350 billion allocated to the Paycheck Protection Program, which are sm forgivable small business loans. And of course, within just weeks, the $350 billion was accounted for, and then subsequently Congress passed an additional measure for $310 billion. Of course, there's also $260 billion of expanded unemployment insurance benefits and $500 billion for loans to distressed companies. So taking a quick step back, uh, what is digital finance all about? Well, at the end of the day, whether it's for consumers, small businesses, or corporates, it's about spending smarter, saving better, borrowing responsibility, responsibly, investing optimally, protecting prudently, and paying frictionlessly. And as we'll explore in the next few slides, fintech innovators were at the forefront in making important contributions for consumers and small businesses. Seemingly overnight, millions of furloughed, laid off, and or um, uh, laid off employees uh, were hit immediately. Within weeks of the pandemic, some 46% of all Americans said that their household had experienced some form of income loss, and individuals quickly started tightening the reins on spending. The post-COVID U.S. personal savings rate uh, spiked to nearly a 39-year high in April. And to get cash into the hands of these individuals impacted, fintech companies like Chime, a neobank, established a payment advance solution before the U.S. stimulus checks were distributed, enabling some of its 100,000 customers to opt into a $200 advance. The effort was advanced by Chime's balance sheet without recourse and ultimately aimed to expedite the, the getting cash into the hands of consumers. Other initiatives were coming from companies such as PayPal, uh, which enabled customers to deposit its checks, its stimulus checks through its app by taking a picture and without fee. And for lower income households, which have been disproportionately affected, 
companies such as Propel, a fintech that's backed by investors such as Andreessen Horowitz, partnered with a nonprofit called Give Directly to crowdsource funds and get uh, cash into the hands of low-income households. There are about 30 million small businesses in the U.S., which employ about half the U.S. private workforce. And early in the pandemic, J.P. Morgan reported in March that's only about 27 days of cash buffer. With brick and mortar shopping declines and overall uh, slowdown in the economy, small businesses have had to act quickly to access capital and adapt their business models. Fintechs have stepped up to enable or actually execute the PPP loans. Plaid, for instance, launched a new product and expedited its, uh, its production to share payroll data in a quick and a secure way, allowing banks to add new small business customers. Companies such as Square, PayPal, Funding Circle, and Cabbage have underwritten uh, PPP loans directly. And in this context, companies such as Tesorio become ever more important. Designed from the ground up for cash flow accounting, Tesorio automatically captures ERP, email, and billing system information and applies AI and machine learning models to generate comprehensive dashboard that answer the question, where are we on cash flow? More bespoke solutions such as working capital loans for dentists uh, came through a partnership between Lendever and Delta Dental. And in this uh, program uh, between Lendever and Delta Dental, they're providing working capital loans of up to $200,000 uh, for dentists. And to support uh, capital flows for small businesses in lower income uh, areas, uh, companies such as C-Note are extending capital to CDFIs, which are community development financial institutions that operate in support of businesses in low to moderate income communities. Without question, COVID-19 has accelerated the, the adoption of digital, online, mobile, and contactless payments for consumers and small businesses. There's no slowing down of digital payments and online commerce. Half of Americans surveyed suggest that they will continue to maintain online shopping levels, even when the pandemic subsides. Similarly, in a recent survey of US small and medium-sized businesses, 66% they will rely more on e-commerce sales after the pandemic. And globally, statistics show that in 2017, roughly 4 billion people were using digital payments. And that figure, of course, is going to increase dramatically. PayPal added 20 million new accounts in Q1 of 2020, and it has expected to add an additional 20 million more in Q2. Acceleration amid the pandemic comes from a mix of customers hunting for ways to begin paying digitally uh, to merchants and also merchants migrating to online retail. With social distancing the norm, Visa has seen tap-and-go payments increase by 40%, with shoppers less interested in touching, even NFC-enabled payments have risen in recent weeks. In March, Walmart announced that they were making changes to the in-store Walmart Pay app so that it could be touch-free using a QR code. Companies such as Shopify, a platform that enables retailers to have an online presence, has also seen a dramatic increase of roughly 30% due to the omni-channel products that it's recently offered. And the same is for Square, which has enabled online presence for merchants and has seen uh, gross payment volumes increase by sometime, some amounts of up to five times. So looking ahead, you know, I think that there are gonna be some really interesting transitional changes. Unemployment and economic uncertainty will potentially lead to higher delinquencies and loan losses. FICO scores will be impacted into, in the intermediate term. And companies that, such as Lend Street that focus on debt consolidation or Resolve that focus on debt restructuring or Upturn that focus on credit rehabilitation will become uh, more and more um, important. Uh, I think we're going to see somewhat of a downturn uh, in the mortgage market, despite historic lows in the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. Um, there are concerns in terms of unemployment, and already 3.8 million Americans are on forbearance plans. And firms such as Better Mortgage have the potential uh, to be a digital-first uh, mortgage solution for homeowners looking to secure a loan. 
I think there's going to be some interesting ties between mental and financial health. According to some research, some 39% of American workers suffer from mental health issues, ranging from moderate distress to serious mental illness. Almost half of Americans, roughly 45%, say that, it in, that during the coronavirus, their mental health, health has been negatively affected. And companies such as Honeybee are enabling employers to offer their employees uh, loans by securing their paid time off. Um, and so I also wanted to give a quick shout out to our webinar we had last week, uh, which was focused on healthcare. Um, digital identity, identity will gain stronger interest. The concept of a digital passport um, is something that has been discussed uh, quite often in the context of blockchain. And given the fact that there's been renewed interest in health records and where people are going, the idea of a self-sovereign uh, identity system could be interesting for companies such as Civic, Tradle, and others. And then in the longer term, you know, there are some questions around uh, policy implications. Um, you know, Andrew Yang recently ran on the premise of a universal basic income. And even before the pandemic started, we have seen a rise in global in populism across the globe. And with a surge in unemployment, some analysts expect that populism may actually gain more traction, which may lead to some interesting policy implications on uh, where governments spend cash. So for banks, um, virtual and digital service will become ever more critical uh, with call volumes already at record highs, digital tools to support customer service uh, and to support regulatory compliance become ever more important, whether that's a chatbot such as Avamo's uh, multi-sectoral chatbot, video-based instruction tools such as Zoom and others, all of these tools become all the more important for us. And for banks specifically, um, you know, many of them are still built on old outdated systems. There was a recent survey that suggested that some 40% of banking systems were still using COBOL, which is a program language dating back to the uh, 1950s. And there's been a very, very compelling need during the light, in, in light of COVID for back office overhaul. So whether that's tools and automation, such as, uh, again, chatbots, but also RPA, robotic process automation, migrating to the cloud, et cetera, we're seeing increasing numbers of B2B companies focus on supporting uh, increased uh, digital transformation. And this is my last slide here, and then uh, soon I'll just uh, introduce uh, Carlos. Uh, but in light of the economic severity in the intermediate term, and until the vaccine becomes available, um, the economic impacts will depend really on how much the government will borrow from future generations and support, again, the fiscal policy uh, of getting cash into the hands of consumers, small businesses, and corporates. And for businesses specifically, this is a very important time in building resilience and, and quickly turning to digital tools to enable more efficient operations um, and ultimately uh, transitioning into the next normal. So with that, I just wanted to introduce uh, Carlos. Uh, Carlos Vega is co-founder and CEO of Tesorio. Uh, and we'll hear more about Tesorio specifically in just a minute. Um, Carlos has um, an uh, MBA from Wharton. He spent some time in investment banking at Lazard, um, co-founded a factoring company previously, and has worked for General Motors in their uh, pension fund. Um, I've, we've known Carlos for a couple of years now, and we're super thrilled to hear more about the progress of Tesorio and also the capabilities of where they are today in supporting treasurers, finance professionals, um, and the like. So, Carlos, uh, thank you so over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a uh, it's great to hear uh, a little bit about your background as well. Thank you for uh, allowing me to hear your slides. Uh, it was very insightful. Uh, so, you know, you have a little bit about uh, about my background. Um, should we go on to the next slide, uh, Moses? Just... Perfect. Yeah. So, just just by way of background, right? Uh, you saw there. I spent about a decade working in finance. Uh, in various roles, I'd say professionally grew up the most working at Lazard doing investment banking, 
uh, and then transitioned over uh, to uh, starting my own company. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about Sorio, but first, if, if you know, we go to the next slide, you know, just to give you a little bit of background, something that you're all probably familiar with, uh, most companies are managing their cash flow in Excel, right? And so that's a problem we started looking at first um, and really trying to understand, okay, given the technology that's out there today, right, where most companies are working, uh, you know, relying on systems of record to gather information, export it, put it in Excel, put it together, whether that's, you know, bank transaction information, accounting information, CRM data, uh, trying to, uh, you know, gather together notes from different teammates, you end up with, you know, two opportunities, right? With, um, you know, all this data lying in different systems of record, you know, better cloud technology, most tools now having API connectivity, uh, and then the facilitation of, you know, machine learning through better computing power, there was something, you know, impactful to be done, but something had to change too, right? So on the next slide, right, there were definitely tailwinds, right, that have been pushing these things. I just named a few technological tailwinds. There are also, uh, interestingly, a lot of the regulators out there are saying, look, eventually someone's someone's going to make a pretty bad mistake, and, and people have already. I think we all have an experience uh, owning an Excel spreadsheet where we forgot to update a VLOOKUP or an accidental constant was left inside the formula. All these types of things constantly happening. It happened, used to happen to me in investment banking. It's why you had so many people reviewing the model before it went to a client. And so something had to change, right? So on the next slide, what you can see is a little bit of our approach, right? So really at Tesorio, what we do is we help companies manage, predict, and collect cash, right? So it's really about integrating all the data from your different systems of record and thinking about how you make it actionable. And the most interesting thing is really realizing that so much of the data you might need is already in your company somewhere. Uh, you can refer to it as you know, real-time data or data from the front lines that if you could access it, it would be really impactful. As an example, let's say you want to predict your uh, collections, right? Your, where am I gonna land on cash inflows for this quarter? Uh, most companies have somewhere between five to 10 folks out there calling their customers all the time some have 200 people calling their customers to find out, hey, when are you going to pay? What's the promise to pay date? Logging notes, logging risk. Oh, this customer looks like they might default. This customer looks like they might need a payment plan, all this type of information. And it's typically been sitting in Excel files or even Google Sheets, right? One of our customers, um, Slack, right? Recent customer, you would imagine, uh, okay, Slack has an amazing communication platform. They must be speaking with each other through Slack or contacting their customers through Slack. And actually, it was good old email and a Google Sheet is how they, you know, a company like Slack was managing their collections. Um, so if you can take all that information by plugging into their email systems, by plugging into their billing systems, plugging into their banks, plugging into Stripe and getting the actual sub ledger transaction data, not just the aggregate, how much money did I just get paid, plugging into the accounting systems, looking at sales orders, purchase orders, invoices, bills that are coming up, new customers added, new vendors added, a new account is closed in Salesforce, it doesn't yet exist in NetSuite. That sometimes gets lost all the time, you know, and, and, and it can lead to all sorts of, um, you know, gaps in how cash comes into your company. So on the next slide, uh, just to give you a little bit about how we built the company, right, it, it's, it's a fundamentally different architecture uh, for, you know, these types of companies and in, in, in the new wave of, of finance, right? Um, you think about them, and it's not just finance, just intelligent applications across the board, right? They're architecturally different, right? From the ground up, you have a core focused on ingesting data, transforming the data for the objective that you're trying to achieve, um, so that then you can deliver the value that you're trying to promise for the customer, right? So as an example, uh, if I'm going to plug into Salesforce, if I'm to Sorio and I'm going to plug into Salesforce, I don't necessarily need every email, every exchange, every contact, all that information. I might need contact information so that a customer can use our CRM to get in touch with their customer and find out when they're going to get paid. But I really need, you know, the sales order information, the billing information. I need to structure it in a way that I can do time series analysis because doing a time series analysis to figure out how my customers are growing is very different from doing a, um, you know, review of my pipeline to figure out 
what which deals are going to close next, which is something that a company, maybe a company like Clary does, right? And so we can plug into the same data set, but look for slightly different things given the objective of what we're trying to help the customer with, right? And so you really do have to imagine that platforms today that are built to bring in data from all these different systems are architected differently to transform the data to meet the objective of the customer. Um, so just a few examples on, on the next slide of different things that we can help with. You know, at the top, you'll see the, the most, you know, you know, objective way of think about, thinking about it is that we look at, you know, data sets are, are, are kind of the way things have typically been talked about, but now it's more about data networks. So how is, in the example I was giving, let's pick forecast accuracy, right? Um, you know, I'm trying to figure out how I am going to forecast collections based on the way that my frontline collectors are speaking with my customers and the promise to pay dates I'm getting from customers and all that sort of information. And I'm plugging into email, I'm plugging into Salesforce, I'm plugging into Zora, I'm plugging into my ERP, let's say NetSuite. In order to gather all that information and make sense of it, I have to know that, let's say I'm selling to Microsoft, that Microsoft in my accounting system is the same Microsoft in my email system, is the same Microsoft in Zora, is the same Microsoft in Salesforce. That's called joining the data sets. And that's what we mean about a data network. It's really about taking all the information from all the different places and making sense of it, putting it into context, right? It's very different from maybe, you know, in 2012, people were talking about big data, like just throw all the data into a data warehouse for data lake and you know, throw some algorithm at it and see what happens. It's, it's, it's very different when you're focused on an objective. And that's how things have evolved, which is very interesting uh, overall, right? Um, you know, and, and the really powerful thing is when you do this well, uh, you make this information available to people who otherwise might not typically go for it, right? So as an example, if you go to the next slide, it's really interesting. You know, you know, speaking of Slack, right? Like a tool like Slack, um, you, if you use it, you know people live in it, right? Um, and so a measure of how often or how much people live in a tool is, you know, they refer to it as Dow Mao or daily active user over monthly active user. So it's a measure of, you know, for the people that are on my platform, you know, what percent of them are like actively in it every day, right? And so a really good stat for someone like Slack, as an example, is in the low 50s. All right. So you can imagine, just imagine a finance tool, which is pretty boring, um, being used as often as Slack by the teams that use them. Right. Um, and then when I say teams, just think a little bit, you know, I mentioned before the capability that can be enabled or the empowerment that can come to other teams by making this data easily accessible and usable. Right. We're now seeing customer success teams onboarded onto our platform sales teams onboarded onto our platform. Because if you think about a account at risk, how they're paying you is a pretty strong sign of how they feel about you, right? Or where they are relative to your credit limit um, is pretty important for a salesperson trying to upsell a new account. Uh, and so there's all this useful information in the product that gets now used by other teams, which was a pleasant surprise for us. And they're using it a lot, which is great. Um, so. Again, the, the next slide just kind of shows you a little bit of a case study there on one of our you know, uh, top customers. You know, two quarters in, uh, they're calling out improvements on their earnings calls, right, about uh, you know, performance and cash from operations being driven by strong collections. Uh, <laughs> I wish they'd mentioned our name in their earnings call. It didn't quite go there. Uh, maybe that will happen in the future. Um, but still, it's you know we've got a strong relationship with uh, Tim Cabral, uh, the CFO of Viva, um, and then the other part is the partnership. Earlier, I showed you a quote about um, you know KPMG's guidance to audit committees saying, "Hey, look, you guys have to do something about it." And Viva very proudly said, "Like we are, we partnered with this company called Tesorio, and they actually presented Tesorio a whole presentation to their audit committee about Tesorio and the way that they've partnered with us to help address um, this." digitization, right, of, of the way that they manage things. Um, so with that, you know, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Moses, uh, and uh, excited for, for our chat. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, really super interesting. And, um, 
you know, over the next uh, roughly a few minutes here, uh, maybe five minutes or so, just wanted to step back and ask you just kind of a couple of questions, um, maybe just to orient ourselves in the light of, in light of the pandemic. I'm right. curious if you could just describe to us kind of your, your sort of COVID, COVID moment, like when did you kind of realize this thing was, uh, this thing was real and, and, and what did you do as kind of CEO to kind of quickly adapt to the, the situation? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I definitely remember. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm actually down in Panama, uh, as we were talking about before. So we've always been a distributed company. Uh, so the work from home aspect wasn't a challenge in terms of figuring out how to hire people without meeting them or how to run a business with people, uh, you know, not all in the same office. But I do think that there were definite changes. Um, so I'll talk about those in a sec. But, you know, from the COVID moment, uh, it was actually the first case here in Panama uh, was announced on my mom's birthday. Uh, we, we were out out to dinner, uh, the whole family, and um, and we kind of all looked at each other. We all got text messages. It might be the last time we all hang out together for a long time. Uh, and it, in effect, in Panama, it's been very very strict. Uh, it's strict quarantines where uh, you're only allowed out for two hours every other day and things like that. So uh, some of you have it better than us down here, um, but. Uh, but yeah, that, that, I very clearly remember that. Um, and as a company, right, in terms of impact for us, I say, again, the distributed aspect wasn't as big of an issue. We've got folks in you know, five or six countries in Latin America, across 16 different states in the US. Um, I'd say for probably many of us with children, I'd say the homeschooling and keeping up with uh, kids' responsibilities as well as professional responsibilities has been the bigger challenge and adapting to that has been uh, where we've put a lot of focus. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Now that that's super helpful, and um, you know, I'm curious. You know, there's something that you wrote not too long ago um, uh, in a, in a blog that had in you know, check out Tesoria's website. Um, I know Carlos has written a few blogs that are I think very timely. Um, but one of the things that stood out to me was this quote where you say, you know, above all, empathy matters, and right. so this idea of you know. You write, not only is your own business likely struggling now, but so is your customer's customer and their customer, right? So there's, there's sort of this value chain of different businesses interacting with each other and, and, and how to be empathetic. So I'm, I'm curious if you could comment on like, what were some of the particular needs that bubbled up from either your customers or their customers in light of the pandemic? And, and how did you sort of um, work with them and, and help them navigate through some of those challenges? Right. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned earlier in, in your talk was about, you know, you had that slide where you showed the different areas of how uh, companies can evolve, right, for the new normal or next normal in finance. At, at the bottom of your slide, you had uh, payment optimization or payment timing optimization controller on that. And so, you know, given our product, right, which is, again, helping companies forecast their cash flow and then giving them actionable tools to do something with it, right? So all right, you've got a forecast on cash and I want to follow up with my customer. You know, in our product, you can click through and see that, you know, a customer is supposed to pay you next month and drop them in a campaign and follow up and have the product follow up with them automatically. It led itself naturally, it lent itself naturally to um, helping to educate customers about how they can communicate with their customers in order to, to get paid on time. Um, and we helped, what we did was, you know, we hosted a few webinars, uh, which are available on our website, of course, but, you know, one of the most interesting ones was with the former CFO of Oracle, former CFO of NetSuite, and, um, you know, and our, our board member and former CFO of uh, Kings, which is a candy crush maker. Um, and so with those folks, it was interesting to hear about different options and strategies that people have taken, right? And so one of them is really, like, some of the more counterintuitive ones are, now, some of the obvious ones, I guess, are, you know, in the language that you use to follow up with your customer, um, make sure you're acknowledging the fact that it's tough for everyone, right? And so you're calling them up or emailing them to follow up like, about a payment or something like that. Acknowledge. I imagine that you are doing the same with your customers. I imagine that, you know, it, it's, it's difficult right now. You're very carefully timing your payment runs and things along those lines. But the counterintuitive part was... Um, Hearing in, in another webinar, uh, we had the heads of collections of Slack and Snowflake and, and Viva, and and one of them was saying that um, 
that there's a limit to, right? Uh, which is, you know, just because it's COVID-19, if someone was a bad credit before, they're probably going to still be a bad credit. So the challenge with empathy in the roles of the folks that we're talking about, CFOs, is, you know, they do, obviously, they care a lot about their customer base because attrition is not good for anyone, right? But they also have to walk a fine line between um, making sure that they're still being responsible from a credit worthiness perspective. So again, it, it comes down to acknowledging uh, the situation that we're all in, uh, which is shared, of course, um, but also continuing to be responsible from a credit perspective, which is a challenge for banks right now as well, I can imagine. No, that's, um, that's uh, I mean, I, I really like that. And you know, how, how you, you know, position and communicate to your customers and uh, how you acknowledge the situation that they might be in, I think is uh, paramount during this time. Um, I'm going to ask one more quick question. It's a little bit more forward-looking, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to steal another quote from you, which is, out of every crisis comes great opportunity. The most innovative products come out of recessions and amid creative difficulties. Um, and as companies adapt to the new realities of, of COVID and as you look forward into like the intermediate and then even longer term, I'm curious if you could comment on some of the innovations that, that you at Torsorio are thinking about and or perhaps some of the things that your customers uh, will likely perhaps demand from, from you at Tesorio. Totally. Yeah, I do have to attribute uh, the, the, the full quote to a much greater person. Uh, Winston Churchill said, uh, never let a crisis go to waste is where that comes from. <laughs> but but um, but yeah, totally. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I'd say I'd say right now, uh, the most innovative companies are finding ways to drive value for their customer that are aligned with the value of, and, and, and mission of their of their own company, right? Um, and so, you know, as a, as I mentioned before, you know, with us in terms of, you know, what we do is driven around reducing volatility around cash flow by helping you stay in touch with your customers, um, helping you project where you're going to land on cash, helping you time your AP. You know, it lends itself quite a bit to helping to manage cash flow in this situation. Um, but then you you highlighted some great examples, right, of folks who have gone a little bit above and beyond to partner with um, nonprofits that are aligned with their mission, right? And so that's some of the stuff that um, I think the most innovative companies are going to capture, you know, back tying to empathy is the fact that uh, if you're not acknowledging the troubles that people are dealing with right now, whether it's your customers or your customers' customers, and then you're not doing something about it, right? Um, and we've seen this, you know, not just with the health pandemic. I mean, recently, of course, with a lot of, you know, social change that's happening in the United States in particular, there's a lot of acknowledgement that you have to consciously make about what's going on around you um, in order to stay relevant, I think. You know, I think if you're not thinking about these things, you're going to be held accountable pretty soon in the near future, right? Um, and it has to be authentic um, and come from a place of empathy. So now, in terms of pure technological innovation, you know, just some quick examples for us, you know, in terms, you know, one of the things in our product is a payment portal that allows customers to uh, get paid electronically by their customers instead of waiting around for a check, which is something, you know, some of our customers still send us a check. One of us has to go to the office and pick it up and deposit it with their mobile, uh, with their cell phone, um, right? What about putting into that payment portal, uh, you know, dynamic discounting capability? So a company can say, hey, look, I've got some, you know, right now I've got a need. Uh, so if you're willing to pay me faster, I'll give you a 2% discount or something like that. Um, but on the AR side, right, we've seen that on the AP side. So that's like one small example of a technological innovation, but I think it's more holistic, like I was mentioning before around embracing other opportunities to demonstrate, uh, you know, uh, empathy, I guess, with and, and acknowledgement to, to the situation we're all in. And happy to double click on any of that. You know, I, I didn't want to go too deep into the tech side, whether it's, you know, machine learning work or, or uh, you know, product work, but I'll, I'll let you guys guide. Yeah, that. no, that, that's, that's perfect. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for all of that. I think the, uh, you know, the idea of, you know, you mentioned like the, the nonprofit work, there's just a lot of thinking in terms of how to actually extend 
um, fin access to financial services and um, actually help uh, people or, or customers in the time of need. And so I think uh, all of your words, I think, resonate with uh, our audience here. Um, with that, I guess, you know, Will would love to turn it over to you to help us navigate some of the questions we have. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, thank, I mean, thank, thank you both for the, those really interesting perspectives. I mean, I thought the overview you gave, you gave was really great, Moses. Um, and then Carlos, like you really zoomed in on, on a specific piece of digital transformation, you know, from your perspective and kind of actually zoomed out as well. So I, that was great. Um, I'll try and be quick. So we have about five minutes. The first question I'm going to blend to uh, is kind of a macroeconomic question. So how do we see the global and American recovery looking? And, you know, there was talk of a, of a V-shaped recovery. Some indicators um, show that that won't be the case. Maybe retail sales, for instance, have erased all their losses. Like, so maybe we're back. I don't know. How are government stimulus programs going to end? And or the second question, which is related, you know, how um, do, are governments going to further boost for the, the financial sector? Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Broad. Carlos, do you want to take that one? Yeah, it's not it's not anything I'm an expert in, so I I, uh, I feel like I'll just be sharing opinions. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess all, all I can refer back to is like reading I've done back. It's just interesting to see what we were projecting back in March and April. You know, looking through the McKinsey uh, deck that was sent around. You know, Citibank had sent around some decks around. You know, what happens if we don't open up by uh, X quarter? And I think we were well past um, the worst case scenarios they had discussed, which at the time were projecting recoveries um, and full economies opening up in 2023 um, if we were hitting the worst cases. Um, so there's, there's definitely a lot of interesting um, material from experts out there. I, I wouldn't say I, I feel qualified to uh, provide much more uh, information uh, about this question. Yeah, I think we're just an uncharted territory. I think the one thing I will note is that unlike the, the Great Recession, as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, you know, um, monetary policy is, is quite limited at this point. I mean, uh, the question of whether or not we can just kind of lower rates um, uh, is sort of out of the question right now. It's really we're relying on getting, again, cash into the hands of consumers and businesses and corporates, either directly and as a stimulus check or through loans to, to stimulate the demand. And the question, or, or the question that we have to ask ourselves is, uh, is the government gonna be able to continue to borrow from future generations to fund that? Um, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a clear answer either, but I'm optimistic cautiously that some of the news in from the vaccine, there's some chatter about a vaccine from, I think, Oxford that might hold some promise. But once we get that, then I think we're going to start to see a more of a V-shaped recovery. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's, now, flipping, let's go to the microeconomic uh, question came in about, you know, getting access to data is, you know, one of the hardest challenges when onboarding a, a big corporation. How does Tesorio approach, you know, demonstrating ROI uh, when there's resistance to sharing data? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, so basically the way that we've approached it uh, is there's different aspects of our platform, right? And so that's why the actionability aspects are very important, right? So if you come into a company and you say, hey, look, I'm going to plug in and give you a magical forecast and it will resolve all your forecasting issues, that's going to take some time to prove, right? But if you can come in and say, look, I've got an accounts re receivable CRM that you can utilize right away. And in the next couple of weeks, you will see your collectors touching, you know, 4X more customers um, per day, uh, reducing your DSO X amount, um, increasing your collections, collections efficiency and driving predictability in your collections. Um, that is something that's very tangible um, and, a, and, a, and a high ROI. Uh, so, uh, you know, as far as Historio is concerned, our approach is to go in with a wedge and then land and expand. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll do one more question uh, before Moses can wrap up, but um, I, I like this one. So over the 2010s, fintech companies have mostly innovated at the customer layer, you know, yep. for instance, improving the customer experience by making it mobile first, faster, more engaging, et cetera. 
going into the 2020s, do you think we're going to see innovation at deeper, kind of more foundational layers of the financial industry? You know, those layers involved or written in COBOL or Fortran, you know? Totally. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we've got a strong partnership uh, with Bank of America as an example, right? And what we're seeing there is uh, they actually do have, uh, you know, we're running databases from, you know, modern companies internally. Um, you see them uh, increasing their flexibility, not just them, by the way, like all many banks, uh, in, increasing their openness for working with fintechs. And what, what we're seeing in our experience in some of these companies is uh, bringing in a partner like ours, like us, right, who can more rapidly iterate and plug into the different even internal databases is allowing them to connect different systems of record in-house for different purposes across teams that might be valuable. As one example, right, if you've got a trade team uh, and, in, a, in a bank um, and you've got the commercial, you know, facing SMB or mid-market facing team, uh, wouldn't it be great for a trade team to be able to understand who the bank's got relationships with uh, in order to approach new deals, right? It sounds pretty basic, but you know, to the to Alex's point, um, with the older infrastructure, that has been challenging, right? And so, what I what I would say is that you can expect to see here, from what I'm seeing already, is yes, a change in the in core infrastructure, but also an openness to partnership that allows them to leapfrog, uh, you know, opportunities uh, through. Uh, use of intelligent applications that can help them join uh, their different data sets as well. It's interesting, and I think it uh, resonates across these um, different areas of digital transformation, but it, it's sort of not just incremental change, but allows a fundamentally different like behavior of the company. Um, I'll, I'll leave the questions to that. We have a few more, but um, and thanks for those who put the questions in. Um, thanks for your answers. I'll let Moses take it away. By the, by the way, I did have one one quick thing on the economic aspect. I think it's important to also like dissociate the industries is like one thing I would say that I'm seeing just from a micro perspective um, is you know, some areas are going to have tailwinds and some are going to have headwinds. So it's very important, you know, speaking in general terms, I, you know, it, it's challenging. But once you start dissociating that, I think it can start to become very interesting um, to see uh, and also just consider where investment should be made. That's fantastic. And actually, maybe if I could ask Carlson, just a quick plug. I mean, what are some of your near term priorities? Uh, mm -hmm. What are, you, are there partnerships you're looking for? Or like, what are, what are some of the things that you're uh, going yeah, after? Definitely. Yeah, it's a, it's a great, great question. And thanks for <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah, we are. We are looking uh, right now, actually, to uh, create uh, more partnerships like the ones we have uh, to get our product out into the hands of of more companies and some of, you know, on the product side, it's not just you know. It's not just the BD side. On the product side, from a technological innovation perspective, we find that our job, you know, while historically we've focused on middle market or uh, you know smaller public companies, um, bringing the technology that we've talked about to more companies so that we can help them manage their cash flow as well. Even the SMBs we traditionally have not focused on is also something that we believe is important part of our contribution to what's going on now. So over the next six months, you will see us making our product a lot more almost consumer grade in the way that you can adopt it and use it. Um, so types of partnerships, you know, with accounting firms, PE shops, um, that type of thing um, to get out to uh, those folks that we can help the most. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. That's fantastic. Um, you know, just a quick summary of just a couple of things I've heard. I mean, you know, with Carlos's fantastic insight, you know, um, taking disparate uh, sources of data and harmonizing them in such a way that provides actionable intelligence is, is paramount in times like this. Um, showing and communicating specifically the empathy, not only to your customers, but understanding their respective customers' issues and concerns in light of the pandemic is also paramount. Um, and I think what we've heard from Carlos as well is during this time, there is going to be a lot of innovation. And we've already heard a number of ways that Carlos and Tesorio are going to be uh, innovating. And so if, if there are folks on the line today who would love to, who would like to connect with Tesorio, we at OSV would be more than happy to facilitate um, that introduction. 
Um, just a quick reminder that we, you know, this is a part of a broader series, which you can check out um, uh, on the link below. And I just want to put a quick plug into um, kind of our, our revamped effort in terms of how we engage with corporates through our co-innovation program called X-Force. And so if there are any other corporates on the line today that are looking to innovate together with, with companies such as Tesorio, among others, uh, please reach out to uh, my colleague, David and uh, Ellen. And with that, I think we're just a minute over, but yeah, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Carlos, uh, you are awesome. Thank you so much for dialing in from uh, best of luck on the transition, yeah. We appreciate it every time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Will. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.